Order, order, and welcome to the Scottish Affairs Committee, and we are delighted to be joined by the Cabinet Secretary and a couple of his colleagues, who he will now introduce to us, as part of our Devolution 25 Years Intergovernment Relations. Cabinet Secretary, we're, we're pleased, as always, to see you at this committee. If you could please introduce yourself, your two colleagues, and anything by way of a short introductory statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, convener. I'm delighted uh, to be giving evidence to the Scottish Affairs Select Committee. Delighted to be joined by Ewan Page and Donald Cameron, two of my senior officials at the, uh, at the Scottish Government, and welcome to you all to my constituency in the, uh, in the Scottish Parliament. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to come and, and speak to you all about uh, the important matters of uh, intergovernmental relations, and happy to answer all questions about that subject this morning. Let me address head on the question of how the relationship between the UK Government and the Scottish Government was originally envisaged. And that answer is plain, not like this, not the way it is at the present time or in recent years. And while there are good examples of collaboration, the simple reality is that the actions of the UK Government since 2016 especially have caused significant damage to the devolution settlement, uh, which was established, as, as we all know, with overwhelming public support in 1998. It's not always been so. In the period before Brexit, intergovernmental relations were underpinned by a common understanding where successive UK governments, generally and rightly, recognised that devolved matters were the responsibility of devolved institutions, operating under the common framework provided by EU structures and EU law. Intergovernmental arrangements and relationships were able to deal effectively with significant political, legislative and administrative challenges in the period up to 2016, which included reaching the Edinburgh Agreement in 2012. However, the position has deteriorated badly since 2016 as a consequence of Brexit, so much so that the very existence of devolved government is under threat as never uh, before. And this threat is not confined to Scottish devolution. The Constitutional Commission of Wales concluded that the, and I quote, current settlement cannot be taken for granted and is at risk of gradual attrition if steps are not taken to secure it, and that without urgent action there will be no viable settlement to protect. Since 2016, we've seen an increasingly interventionist approach into devolved policy matters in the erosion of the protections provided to devolved institutions, none more so than the hollowing out of the Sewell Convention and the Internal Market Act. The Internal Market Act was, of course, imposed on the Scottish Parliament, despite a refusal of consent, and embodies the challenge we face in establishing more equitable and sustainable relationships between governments, not least because it fundamentally undermines the Common Frameworks programme, which is a result of good collaboration between governments. Incidentally, if you want an example of effective working uh, between ministers, and I'll come back to this at some length if colleagues are interested, Chloe Smith's brief involvement in the relationship that we were able to establish was key to progress being made on the Common Frameworks. However, the Internal Market Act cuts right across frameworks and has been used by UK ministers to overrule and frustrate devolved decision-making, most prominently with the deposit return scheme. But despite all of this, I want to emphasise the importance of good intergovernmental relations and the Scottish Government's commitment to playing its part as an equal partner. Our objective for IGR is simple. We want the best possible outcomes for Scotland, working constructively with partners across these islands, including the UK Government. And our approach will continue to be to collaborate where our interests align and where there is proper respect for devolved powers and responsibilities. However, despite examples of good collaboration, the effect of the UK government's actions is to constrain the powers and responsibilities of devolved institutions, and ultimately this approach frustrates the very purpose and operation of devolution. Previous experience shows that it does not have to be like this, even under the current constitutional arrangements which rely on expected standards of behaviour rather than enforceable rules. The new improved IGR structures and principles lay the foundation for good intergovernmental working and experience so far suggests that procedures and processes, however well designed, can only be effective if they are applied with good faith and integrity by all parties and the Scottish Government is committed to playing its part. Thank you very much. And thank you for that very concise <coughs> introduction. You paint a very gloomy account of the current conditions of intergovernmental relations. And you know, there's several things that you said there which we'll want to explore just a little bit further. But I just want to get your view about why do you think it's got to the stage? Why does the Scottish Government feel that they're in such a situation and condition? Is there anything that you've perhaps detected that has led us to get there? I'll, I'll come to the solutions in a minute, but I just want to know from yourself just why you thought, think we've got to the 
point where a constitution secretary of the Scottish Government is coming to this committee and telling us such things? Well, the first thing I would say to you after a number of years in, in this post is not just the Scottish Government. So if you had a Welsh Government Minister here, if you had the Welsh First Minister, if you had my opposite number, Mark Antony here, if you had Vaughan Williams here, if you had in any of my Welsh Government colleagues, they would be telling you exactly the same thing as I'm telling you, because we have the same views on the problems that are being faced by devolved administrations. And no doubt now that um, institutions are up and running in Northern Ireland, if you were to speak to um, um, ministers from there, incidentally on both sides of the constitutional uh, divide in Northern Ireland, they would also be saying exactly the same thing to you. This is not a Scotland-specific issue. Um, it's something that is, is um, reflective, unfortunately, of a state of mind uh, in Whitehall. Um, which is uh, that the devolved administrations, bless you, the devolved administrations are to are to be managed, are to be put in their place, um, and this, I mean, um, much has been written um, about uh, a debate that has taken place in the UK government about what's known as muscular unionism or seeking a more uh, cooperative approach to thing, things, and you can definitely see how there's a fluctuation in that mindset and how that then impacts on interrelationships. But at the, the bottom line is that the UK government does not take intergovernmental relationships seriously. I could evidence you, and I'd be happy to provide the committee with chapter and verse about meetings which are not attended, meetings which are cancelled. I think I'm right in saying uh, that the Prime Minister, our British Prime Minister, has not attended um, a, a full British-Irish Council meeting since Gordon Brown did in 2010. Uh, that goes all the way then through JMC's International uh, Interministerial Council, full meetings, full meetings of the British-Irish Council. Um, goes through the interministerial um, meetings, the JMC meetings that uh, take place and have taken place. Um, and it, it's, it's, not, it's not good reading. And what it shows is that uh, senior ministers, I don't think, um, are particularly interested in having good intergovernmental relations, because if they did, they'd turn up. If they'd turn up, they'd provide um, the, the necessary documentation in advance of meetings. If they're seeking, <clears throat> if they're really interested in seeking um, uh, progress on things, they would be keen to discuss um, substantive issues uh, as they progress, and one wouldn't be resorting to um, uh, using constitutional shortcuts to stymie decisions that have been uh, made in the in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, rather, that one would have been having ongoing discussions. Uh, earlier about that. I mean, one of the good things about having a, a GB uh, civil service is that civil servants working for the Scottish Government will be speaking to their uh, opposite numbers in UK government departments regularly. So little should come as a surprise to either the UK Government or the Scottish Government unless information is being withheld. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm always keen to start at the beginning because I've now given evidence around this issue quite a lot, um, both the UK um, um, members of the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And, I, you know, there are good examples. And so I mentioned um, my interaction with Chloe Smith, who at the time was in the Cabinet Office, where we had a particular challenge around the, the working of common frameworks, uh, which is that they weren't working. And I said to her, and she concurred, that we didn't understand why things had come to such an omelette. We'll, we'll come into common frameworks. Because we're, okay. really, we're really keen to capture Sorry, not, you. don't want to jump ahead. No, not at all. We're keen to capture views on all that. I mean, I think you're right in what we've heard in this inquiry thus far is that there's been the three phases of devolution, one, the all happy together with one government across the whole UK, the, the respect days that we had when leading up to the independence referendum, when there did seem to be a, a degree of working together. Then mm. what happened after Brexit? That you've, you've had the great fortune of having the latter periods under your watch. Is it Brexit that's caused these difficulties? Or is there anything else that you could identify that's caused difficulty to these relationships? Or, I, mean, I'm, I'm, I think we're keen to capture what the Scottish Government feels has gone wrong with this. Is there, and then we could look at maybe seeing how that could be put together again. Sure. But just what, what, in your view, is the major cause of the difficulty? Well, I think the key accelerant is Brexit. Because if one looks at what happened, for example, with the overriding of the Seoul Convention, it's not something that really happened before then. In fact, I think I'm right in saying that the first breach of the Seoul Convention was acknowledged as being a mistake. Um, and, you know, there, were, there was apology for it and, you know, no, no offence was taken. It was, I mean, it's just one of these things that can happen given the technical nature of legislation sometime. But for there to be, I think, 11 
um, subsequent um, uh, breaches of the Seoul Convention shows that something has happened. I mean, this, this is something that the UK government has decided to do. It has chosen to override uh, the Scottish Parliament withholding consent, and in many uh, cases, the, the Welsh Senate um, not, not granting consent to. And that goes back in large part to Brexit, relates to legislation that has to do with Brexit. Uh, so that's one part of it. The second part of it is the UK government's unwillingness to allow the common framework process to work. Now, I'm sure you've been in and around the weeds of this um, and the Internal Market Act yourselves. So you'll appreciate that the common framework predates the Internal Market Act. It was seen as being the way of being able to deal with um, different policy priorities um, in different parts of the UK. And that, of course, is what devolution is about, is about trying to find the right solution for the different parts of the UK. And those may very well be different. Uh, and the common frameworks process um, was that which was envisaged as, as working. And then the UK government um, introduced the Internal Market Act, incidentally one of the pieces of legislation that was not granted consent. Um, and that cuts across the workings of the, the common frameworks. Again, I think you've have it, had evidence of it and you'll, you'll know that Plenty of evidence has been given. I, I, I don't want to cut you off. We're going so, to go into sorry, the short, so the short answer is Brexit is the key a, a, a accelerant, and those are the, the two specific examples that I would give. But I do think there's also, and I'll, and I'll leave this, tee this up for any subsequent question, I think there is an issue of who you're dealing with. Yeah. And that's the I think very some issue. are willing to work and some are just not bothered. I mean, there are a couple of things that we've heard in this inquiry. I'm interested in your view and all this, and whether the infrastructure, the institutional um, engagement is robust enough to deal with the differences and the difficulties. A lot of this has been characterised to this committee as relationships. If the mm. relationships don't work, then there doesn't matter what the infrastructure institutional arrangements are, there's going to be fallout and dispute. Is, is, is that a view? Is it all about relationships? Or should we have in place the structures to be able to accommodate a different so, opinion? So yes is the short answer, but even having the structures doesn't guarantee success. It's, uh, the thing that really matters is having both the structures, but also having the willingness to help make them work. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm sure this has been pointed out to you, but if you have a look at the list of interministerial groups, so this is part of the structure that's supposed to have been set up to, to bring ministers together, to, to have common a common understanding of what governments are doing and common challenges or different approaches, that is supposed to be the format now. And this renewed way of intergovernmental working with the, the Scottish Government welcomed is, is what this involves. Now, if I was to say to you that if you go through the... I mean, firstly, have a look at how many of them have been formed, have a look at how many of them have been formed, and have a look at how many of them have never met. Um, and these are, uh, th these include, so in, in my area where I have responsibility for constitution, external affairs and, and culture, take culture for example, there's been so little progress from the UK government's uh, um, uh, Department for Culture, Media and Sport that the devolved administrations have got together uh, to try and uh, initiate progress in this area and there's still absolutely none from the DCMS. And that is not an isolated <laughs> example, I mean simply ask, how many of these interministerial groups have been formed, how many of them have, have met, and what has emerged from them? And it is, it is a sign that, yeah, structures matter, but relationships uh, matter as well. And if ministers want to take it seriously, I'm now in my fourth UK culture um, sector, I think I've met one of them, um, and there have been frequent cancellations. I, and that's just but, but one example of the problem at hand. Okay, that's, thank you very much. Um, now, I know we're going to go around the whole table. We've got you for an hour and a half, mm -hmm. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so I'll now bring in Alan Brown. Alan. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, good morning, Angus. Um, obviously, we've already kind of touched on that the Welsh Government seems to feel the same way as the Scottish Government mm. about what you call the muscular unionism and the breakdown of relationships. It was just in October last year, um, the Welsh First Minister, Mark Drakeford, had said that he thought the UK government's energy to invest in reviving intergovernment relations was at a relatively low ebb. So, in term, terms of that, do you find there's. Oh, sorry. Oops. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Alan. Okay, uh, sorry. So, also, Mark Drakeford was saying that he thought, you know, 
wasn't even the energy there to invest in reviving relations. Would you, I mean, is that a view that you would concur with? And is there any recognition from the UK government about, you know, the need to improve relations? So, I mean, I think rhetorically there is. And if you look at um, Michael Gove, who I think is traditionally seen as, as being the, the point person in the UK government for a relationship with devolved institution, the rhetoric is such that, yes, it's really important that there should be good intergovernmental uh, relations. When I've shared platforms with him and I've pointed out these shortcomings, I mean, he's never, ever dealt with the substance of the criticisms that have, have, have been made. So whenever there's a public-facing avowing of our intergovernmental relations an important thing. Are they a good thing? Yes, people say they are, but in the substance, in the actuality of whether they are or not, I think there's a very different, uh, there's a very uh, big difference. I think um, there's also a difference between different government departments. I think some government departments which have historically had to deal with devolution, pre-Brexit, even pre-devolution of 1998, I think there is a better understanding in some departments. So if you were, I don't know, to pick I mean, DEFRA would probably be a good example where because of um, agriculture and fisheries matters being devolved because of competence that there is in the Scottish Government in, fi in the fisheries area, for example, there, there's been much more of a pragmatic but also historic understanding within the department that these things uh, matter. There are others where it has come very, very, very late to an understanding that there is a requirement to work together. I think the, the best, worst example of that is, I think, 13 requests to meet with the Home Office. Um, and uh, only finally that was uh, acceded to. I mean, more often than not, um, uh, letters that ask for meetings aren't even replied to. Um, so again, going back to my point about about structures, a lot of it's got to do with it's got to do with um, got to do with goodwill. I mean, I find it extraordinary, given. I mean, my officials would raise with me if ever I'm written to by a UK government minister. You know, Minister X or Y has written to you, and it would it would be taken seriously. One would discuss what is one going to reply. The idea that you just wouldn't bother replying, um, um, I, I, I mean, any, but that's the norm, unfortunately, uh, with things. And do you know, I mean, obviously your time comes uh, post Brexit, but yeah. has that been the norm, ignoring letters? Is that is that a new norm now? Well, I mean, I, I can only really speak for myself, um, Mr. Brown, in these in these contexts, and I have predecessors who can who, who can share their who can share their uh, realities. Um, and but that is certainly mine. Um, I mean, I think that I think there are some ministers who are seized of trying to make things work, understand why relationships are important. You know, maybe there's an element to all of this which is the significant churn that there has been in Whitehall of, of ministers coming in, not in office for very long, maybe not finding their feet and understanding why things like this really matter. Um, but across the piece, um, I mean, from the top down, there has been an aversion uh, to meeting with opposite numbers. We saw that recently in, in, in relation to the, the, the former prime minister and his attitude towards meeting his first minister opposite numbers. Um, uh, so, I, I mean, I think this is something that goes from the top down. And, you know, turning up for, you know, a common photo or turning up for a short period of time before substantive meetings take place and then leaving... You know, that unfortunately is, is, is the norm from the top down. It, and it doesn't need to be there. It doesn't need to be that way. We, we turn up, our colleagues turn up, we're there. Um, the, the meetings get cancelled, that some are late. I um, uh, had recent experience of that in terms of our inter interministerial group on, um, on European Union relation. But it was perfectly understandable. My UK government colleague had a vote in the House of Commons. My Welsh colleague had a... You know, these things happen. Um, but across the piece... Um, it's, it's a much more of a structural problem. Okay. Um, I mean, one, one of the big issues, or not big issues, one, the Scottish Parliament obviously is very dependent on the block grant that comes from Westminster, and you've got the budget setting process. Yeah. Now, recently, the, the capital budget allocation to the Scottish Government has been cut by, it's almost 20% in real terms, and you look at that. What kind of consultation is there from the UK Government when they're doing things you know, when the capital budget's getting cut, is there any discussions about what does this mean for pressures on the Scottish Government? I think I'm right in saying that the Deputy First Minister and Finance Minister had a 10-minute video call the morning of the announcement of the most recent budget. I think that's the extent of 
anything that's substantive. Here's, here's so it's, here, here's, here's what's what happening, doing, here's what's happening, on. here's what the consequences are. Okay. Um, and just, so I'll just come back to uh, wider relationships. Are the, the Welsh Labour government obviously are talking the same page as the Scottish government. Do Labour colleagues at Holyrood recognise, you know, the problem and, and see the problem, you know, the breakdown of relations as part of the problem being the UK government? And also in that wider context, if opinion polls are to be believed, there'll be a new Labour government come in at the next general election, if polls are right. Has there been any suggestion of like, a recognition of an issue and how that might be resolved? Quite, quite a lot in that question. Um, uh, sorry, remind me the first part of the question again. So, the Labour colleagues right. at Holyrood so, recognise... Yes. Well, on, on, some, on some the levels, the, the Scottish Labour Party is committed to the repeal of the Internal Markets Act. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's the position of the UK Labour Party, uh, Party, but I, I would maybe we can have clarification during the, the committee. I mean that would be it, no, and I mean, it would it would be great. It would be great uh, to see the repeal of the Internal Markets Act, and uh, um, because I, I do think that um, uh, amongst colleagues in the Scottish Parliament, uh, certainly amongst Labour and I think Lib Dem colleagues, I think I think there is an awareness of how problematic um, it is. So that I mean the first part. I think I think there is an understanding. I think there's a there's a, a political um, priority um, to show that there is, is um, a kind of e equal um, blame in intergovernmental relations not working uh, on, on, on the part of the Labour Party and, and the Lib Dems that hear that quite regularly in the chamber. But I think all of the evidence shows that in terms of trying to make intergovernmental uh, relations work, prepared to turn up to meetings, being there, um, uh, asking for meetings to take place. Um, and both the Scottish Government and the Welsh Government have been working very hard to try and do just this okay. and um, without great success. I think we'll try and stick, obviously, to the terms of the inquiry, if okay. that's all right. Very last quick question, if you've got one more, Alan, because we're just trying to bring other colleagues in. Uh, I suppose I'll just to touch on the common framework. So obviously, you, you mentioned before about resolving issues, but how effectively are the common frameworks working just now in, the, um, in terms of post-Brexit uh, policy and possible divergence from the EU and what that means? Well, I, to go back to my Chloe, exam, uh, Chloe Smith example, um, as, as the first, ha the positive, that glass half full um, assessment of that, I think dealing with somebody, and she was in the cabinet officer, right at the heart of trying to get something to work. I think uh, she, she was as keen as I was, and, and maybe it helps having been at Westminster for quite a long time and, and knowing colleagues from there that if you're serious about doing business and coming to make progress with things, you, you can make relationships work. And that was the case with Clory, and, uh, and it's a very good example to me of the, the potential of making things work. Having said that, um, there are other areas where they simply do not. Um, there, there was a green light in terms of the common frameworks uh, in relationship uh, to the deposit return scheme, yeah. so that was that it went through that process, and then that process was was then overruled. Um, so uh, un unfortunately, it is not I as simple as yeah. yeah. Okay, exactly. well, we're going to have to look there. Thanks, Alan. Um, Wendy Chamberlain. Thank you very much, Chair. And first of all, apologies to Annam Kayser uh, for soaking her uh, Clarks and um, yourself, Cabinet Secretary, for missing that there was a hole in the table there when I placed that jug down. Apologies. Um, so, so far, we've, we've obviously touched on the fact, and you described them as the new IR, IGR systems as being improved. Um, and then you also mentioned the fact that we have rightly seen a real turnover of ministers uh, in Westminster. But one person who's been uh, co constant has been Michael Gove um, with his oversight. Um, obviously, if you're seeing a deterioration, what, what role or otherwise do you believe that he's been playing? Um, I, I think a lot of UK government ministers defer to him uh, in how they should deal with devolution-related uh, issues. That's also, um, that has also been um, so a, a feature in relation to the devolution unit of the Cabinet Office, and those posts were, you know, both of those things were the same at one stage and now no longer are. Um, but he is, um, I think he is seen as, because uh, he's somebody uh, who has, uh, uh, coming from Scotland, he has an, an understanding of politics here, and he has had an understanding of devolution. 
I think people have deferred uh, to him. But often we're, we're dealing with the, the much more iterative process of, of government. It's not about the flaring up of particular issues. It's about you know, how, how does government work to on a day-to-day -day basis? And well, these that's kind of preventing the flare-ups. Well, this is, the, this, is, this is the whole point. Um, I, we may come on to di dis dispute resolution. I mean, to me, the much more important thing, thing is dispute avoidance. Mm -hmm. And, and if, there are, if, there is, uh, if there are good relations with officials who are working with, with one another along the way, and then when things get escalated at a ministerial level, there shouldn't be surprises to anybody, which is why the shortcomings of the system which I've described, which have involved, you know, sort of bare bullet point agendas, no sharing of, of um, documents in advance of meetings and so on, th these are not symptoms of that approach working in practice. So what I'm trying to do is paint a picture between the formal uh, way in which things should work, which you know, no fair-minded person could take objection to, um, but they're actual working um, in practice. Uh, I, I would want to say that it's, it's not the case with all ministers and with all departments. It is not. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, it is, it is too, too, too wide so, an experience. So, so on that, and given that Michael Gove described things as so far so good, what is working well? Um, well, I mean... Uh, so, I mean, to say that it was so far so good when both the Scottish Government and the Welsh Government have said they are not um, is, you know, that is trying to paint uh, something that is just not reflective of objective reality. It's not good, it's not fine, we've said it's not good, we've said it's not fine, uh, and just because a minister asserts it to be so doesn't make it so. Uh, and, you know, that is one of the problems we've got, is that um, there is... Um, there is uh, not a willingness to confront the fact that things have, n have not been working. So let's take uh, some things that, that could be working. I, I, just, I give this example because I'm very closely involved in it because of my responsibilities in terms of external affairs. Uh, last week I had a meeting with um, Europe Minister Leo Doherty, uh, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland and, and Vaughan Gethins of the Welsh Government. And this... Um, is relating to EU TCA matters and a new process which is supposed to involve um, the devolved um, uh, governments being involved in advance of meetings between the UK government and the European uh, Commission. Um, and the most recent meetings have involved papers being shared, have involved substantive agendas. That was not the, the case at the start of the process. So you might say progress, so I'm going to bank that as progress because I'm a glass half full kind of person. So let's just, uh, let's just take that as being, uh, as, as being good progress. The other thing that I thought was refreshing about it was that a number of us raised uh, issues that we were keen for the UK government um, to take another look at. Uh, to think about. So, uh, specifically, I, uh, in, in uh, following on from the UK government's um, uh, readmission to the Horizon programme on university research, uh, myself and other colleagues were raising um, the, the prospect, the potential of, of rejoining Erasmus, something, of course, that the previous Prime Minister at the time said the UK would not be leaving. Um, and um, uh, Leo Doherty said that he was perfectly happy to go away and have a look at them. So this is a discussion not about just the next meeting, the nitty-gritty of what's happening at the next EU-UK TCA meeting, but what might governments think about, because we think that that's important, something shared by my other devolved colleagues uh, on the call. So I'm, I'm going to bank that as good progress and would want to follow that up. And um, if there's, there's more than just warm words, then hopefully we can actually make some progress on, on all of this. Um, th thank you uh, for that. So um, certainly uh, we do have uh, a, a list of all the different areas and how much they've met and how much they haven't. And there's certainly a number of areas where there's been no meetings at all. Has any discussions taken place out with the structures? Because we've also had that evidence too, that some things are taking place out with um, the yes. I IGR structure. Yes, yes. So um, I, uh, the devolution settlement uh, foresaw, for example, that there should be an annual meeting between the UK Foreign Secretary and the Scottish Government's External Affairs Secretary. And I think when I met James Cleverly, I was the first External Affairs Secretary to actually have such a meeting in the, the by then, whatever, 24 years of devolution, 23 years of devolution, perhaps. 
Um, and it was good to meet because there are plenty of things uh, which um, uh, there are um, priorities both for the Scottish Government and the UK uh, Government and having an annual meeting should be, the, should be uh, the least of it. There should be more meetings than that in my view. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the meeting that I was supposed to have with the successor, um, uh, David Cameron, was cancelled and, and no, no subsequent date has, has, yet been, has yet been found for that. So yes, there are other fora where we come together. It might be formally through bilateral meetings that are held. It might take place in uh, fora such as the British Irish um, uh, Council, where you will often have um, uh, Scottish Government ministers and Welsh, Northern Irish, and UK Government ministers, indeed the Channel Island governments, taking part in, in those. For and there will, there will be others where it is possible to catch up. Um, and then one bumps into one bumps into colleagues. Um, and my example around um, the, the Home Office as being an example, there was an, an erstwhile uh, colleague from Westminster who was um, uh, at the time in the Home Office, who, who was in Edinburgh, and we were we were able to meet to talk about how the Home Office deals with the participants of international artists in, in Scottish festivals, which is still a current issue. So yes, there are a range of ways in which we can meet, um, but, but it's not always easy. Thank you. That's good. And can very quickly. Very, one very uh, brief question. So obviously it's important, we're talking about intergovernmental relations here, but interparliamentary relationships are important as well. It's great to have you here today, Cabinet Secretary, but uh, do you recognise that we've had challenges as a committee getting your colleagues to appear before us? And I also accept that that's been the case for Scottish government committees. Um, what can we do to improve those relationships? So I, I looked at the list before coming here. I think you've had, um, I think you've had 13 or 14 Scottish government ministers give evidence before this, this committee over, over recent years. I've given evidence to this committee. I've given evidence to the House of Lords committee. I've given evidence to another ad hoc um, parliamentary um, committee. Um, and I will, I will continue to give um, evidence. I mean, one of the, I mean, scr scrutiny matters, and I think this committee understands that I'm answerable to the Scottish Parliament. Um, um, but I do think that if we want to improve relations and understanding of how things work, then um, uh, we should um, be. Um, uh, working together. There are different ways of giving evidence, of course, and as I said before, convener, if you would wish uh, updated uh, written evidence on, on some of those uh, issues about things uh, not working as they should, uh, happy to provide that uh, afterwards. But I'm, I'm pleased to be here and thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Menzies. Thank you, Chair. Um, Cabinet Secretary, uh, nice to see you again. Just you touched on the fact that some departments were working well and there was that good relationship and then there was other ones where it was, it was dysfunctional in, in your view. You gave examples, I think, um, EFRA uh, and the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs have met regularly since January 22, whilst others still have not been mm. set up. You know, how, why do you think that is? Well, I think the right of initiative lies with, um, with the, the UK departments. Um, um, I gave the example of where we in the cultural space, myself, Welsh and Northern, I think Northern Irish as well as Welsh colleagues, I'm looking at this, there's, there's, there's this issue of how long Northern Irish institutions haven't been uh, up and running, but certainly ourselves and, and Welsh colleagues have been trying to um, is, is, in, encourage, is that the right way of, of putting it, um, the DCMS, uh, to make sure that there are uh, progress. Um, DCMS has a number of other um, interministerial groups as well, I think on, uh, on tourism, um, and uh, on sport as well. I don't think those are up and running. Um, so some, some have managed to do so, others have not. I mean, it would be, it would be great if there um, was any encouragement to try and get these up and running. And then it's to get a, a regular cycle of, of meeting. So it's not just as often sometimes these meetings have felt like a bit of a tick box exercise. Oh, God, goodness, we're going to have to meet. We're going to have to talk about what are we going to talk about. Um, let's get through this as quickly as possible. Um, you know, there are, there's lots to discuss. I would love to hear um, uh, from other colleagues about what they are doing uh, or not doing where we might learn from others and vice versa. There's, there's very little space for that, and I would very much uh, welcome that. So... Um, I think a lot of good faith has gone into trying to get these structures up and running, um, and, um, and they could. Donald, is there something that you're wanting to add there? You have a list in front of you. Um, I can add if you wish, Cabinet Secretary. Um, the committee might want to know that um, following the um, IDR review in 2022, 16 interministerial groups have been set up covering um, the um, main... Um, 
portfolio interests, both in um, the UK government and in the devolved governments. Um, four of those um, in relation to UK um, Education Minister's Council, which, um, although uh, an interministerial group has a different title um, from, from the others, um, but is an IMG, um, a Safety, Security and Migration IMG, um, a Justice IMG, and one um, in relation to Mr Gove's responsibility. So those are four um, additional um, um, IMGs which were established after the IGR review. All of the others, the other 14, were in some way or another functioning before the IGR review. Mm. Okay. And Mr Cameron, just on the, the, the subject of intergovernment relations, I mean, the, the, the Cabinet Secretary's you know, already raised this, but how do you think they're working from a senior official to senior official, or even further down the organisation, you know, when people are talking about you know, implementing things or sharing best practice, how, how is that operating in your view? So I make a couple of um, points in response to that. I think, first of all, to pick up the point the Cabinet Secretary made, um, that the, the formal IGR structures, if you like, are the tip of the iceberg. Um, the, the bulk of the day-to-day -day interactions take place um, on a kind of portfolio-to-portfolio -portfolio, um, basis, an official-to-official -official basis. Um, I think that um, it's a point that is obvious, but that... Um, officials working in the Scottish Government or another devolved government have um, responsibility to support the delivery of uh, devolved government uh, priorities. Um, and similarly, that is the case in relation to, to UK officials. Where, um, and, and you know, the, the vast, you know, re human relationships are human relationships. Um, they will vary, but um, there is good constructive working at official level, as there can be at uh, um, ministerial level. Um, I think that in terms of the, the formal structures, um, one of the um, changes which I think is objectively a, a positive thing is that um, the, the IGR principles which can set out um, the you know, need for respect for respective responsibilities um, of the different governments, um, but also shared responsibility for chairing meetings, for agenda setting. I think that has increased and opened up the space for intergovernmental relations because it's a much more um, consensual process in terms of the support for that engagement where previously and historically that would have been, as the Cabinet Secretary suggests, the, the responsibility primarily of the, the UK mm -hmm. government. So um, I think that is an objective change. I think what we're seeing now is a process of bedding down um, of, of the new arrangements and the experiences um, variable, as the Cabinet Secretary has said. The last point I might make in response to your question is, um, you know, this is a, an inquiry about 25 years of devolution. Um, I think increasingly, um, and I probably fall into this category, the, the number of um, civil servants in devolved governments and in the UK government who have um, experience of the respective systems is, is dwindling. Um, so the number of people in the Scottish Government, for example, who understand how Westminster um, operates is probably reducing, um, and um, vice versa in uh, the UK Government. So work um, that's done on a, a four-nations basis around um, uh, kind of devolution learning week, for example, or um, the um, work around the policy profession, um, which um, relates to multi-level government, which is to increase understanding um, across um, the administrations of how um, our systems work is a, an important point. Um, thanks very much, and, and nice to see former, former colleagues on the, on the committee. I was just going to say one of the other areas, I don't know if this has come up in, in any of the evidence that you've received here, is from our point of view, and it's one shared by the Welsh Government, one of the areas where there is a, where there is a gap in the in an inter, in, uh, ministerial groups uh, re relates to international matters. Um, which, which is really quite important because of the impact that that has on, on devolved policy. To just give some examples, international treaties and agreement, which is reserved, is a matter for the UK government. Having said that, full formal early involvement in, in the development and negotiation uh, of principles in relation to devolved areas would be really good. This does not happen probably at the, properly at the present time. International conferences uh, and negotiations, including to, but not limited to, WTO, Ministerial, World Health Assembly, and, and, and. These are dealing with devolved uh, areas. Uh, promotion of the devolved nations internationally, how that, how that happens. Cooperation and working arrangements between devolved governments and UK staff and British embassies and permanent delegations. Again, there is space for all of these things to be managed 
if there were an IMG to, to do all of this properly. Unfortunately, there isn't. Okay, okay. okay thank, thank you. you. Um, Michael Shanks. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for your time this morning. You said earlier on that the initiative for these intergovernmental groups lies with UK government. Um, from looking at the list of meetings, there were 42 meetings in the last quarter of 2023, none in the culture brief, as you said. Have you sought to host any of these meetings, or is it just one-way traffic on these things? Yeah, we've, um, we, have, um, we, have, we have worked quite hard to get um, um, the, the formal structure up and running. And as part of, part of doing that, of kick-starting that, I have sought to meet all of my opposite numbers. And I think I'm right in saying only one has found time uh, to do so, and, and she is no longer um, uh, in office. So um, I, I, I would love there to be greater interaction on, on um, cooperation in, in the culture space. We had a really good bad example of uh, how the Home Office has mismanaged the participation of, international, um, of an international artist in Scotland's leading international poetry exhibition, um, uh, uh, festival. It's something that the Home Office previously acknowledged was a problem area uh, and that they were, um, they were minded to try and improve things. These are the sort of things that I would wish to be able to bring up at such a culture um, IMG. I've, I've written to the Home Secretary in the, in the meantime asking to meet to talk about that. I'll be happy to update the committee as to uh, whether he is um, prepared to meet the Scottish Government or not. And in your evidence before, I looked at your evidence to the Scottish uh, Parliament's Constitution Committee where you talked about many of the same things. You talked about respect being a, a, a crucial element and that that respect has broken down and a number of our other witnesses have, have made the same point. Obviously, respect is a mutual thing. Do you, do you think there's any responsibility on Scottish government ministers or ministers in any devolved government as part of that as well? Or has all the blame been on, on the UK government? Well, I'll, all I'll do is speak for my, myself. Um, any time that we um, are supposed to be uh, meeting, I, I, I do, I try to. And if it's not possible to meet, uh, to reschedule, to have, a, have an alternative uh, time and place uh, to meet, um, I think um, most of my UK government uh, colleagues have my phone number. I, I am not difficult to reach. So if one's really wanting to make uh, all of this work, one, one can make it uh, work. But I have, unfortunately, too many examples of even um, UK cabinet ministers coming here. Um, one that, that um, sticks in my mind was Jacob Rees-Mogg, who came all the way to Edinburgh, came to Edinburgh and then wasn't prepared to, to, to come and meet in person. Uh, I think we had another cabinet um, uh, minister, uh, Steve Barclay, here last week. Again, he didn't, he didn't have any time to meet a Scottish government uh, minister while he was here, although that meeting was, was asked for. So I, mean, I can speak for myself in, in saying I am more than content to meet with, uh, with colleagues um, and, because I think it's, it's really important. I suppose my, my question about respect, I think, is quite important because the mutuality of that is more than just writing a letter, responding to a letter, or having mm. a meeting. And I take the point you make. But if I can read you just um, one thing you said in your evidence um, to the Scottish Parliament's Committee, interestingly to a question from a different Donald Cameron, uh, who's now a minister in the Scotland office. You said there's an ideological, anti-devolutionary, anti-self-government force at play within the UK government. And I wonder, do you accept that language like that and perhaps the opposing view that might say, well, your government's also ideological and anti-devolutionary, that perhaps that's part of the problem in this breakdown in relationships. I, I don't think so, and I, I, I've, got, I've got high hopes for, for both Donald Camerons, um, but I have high hopes for Donald Cameron in the, um, in the Scotland office because I had a very good working relationship with him, and I think he does understand the issues, so we'll wait and see whether it's an institutional problem um, uh, or one that is, is, um, has potential for uh, improvement. Look, the parties have different uh, views on the constitutional issues should come as no surprise to anybody on the Scottish Affairs Select Committee. But there is no equidistance whatsoever in relation to intergovernmental relations. The willingness to meet, even although there is a difference of view on policies or um, constitutional outcomes, uh, is no barrier from the part of the Scottish Government. And I underscore this, and I will underscore this repeatedly, 
it is exactly the same position as the Welsh Labour government. And so, to my point, it's not about the fact that my party and government supports independence. The Welsh Labour Party does not support Welsh independence. Uh, but it shares our position as the legion of quotes that you will have from Mark Drakeford downwards in relation, in relation to this UK government's approach to devolution uh, in general, but specifically on the, the workings of the Internal Market Act, should put to bed... Uh, any sense that there's an issue of equidistance in this, um, it's a matter that is shared equally strongly by the Welsh and Scottish governments, and unfortunately the blame lies full square and entirely on the UK government. So, I mean, to take that very point then, do, do you think that there's nothing else the Scottish government could do to try and re-engage in intergovernmental working or improve those relationships? Do you think it's entirely down to, well, to all UK I, All I can say is I can, I, can, I can play my part in that and, you know, whether it's uh, Leo Doherty last week or other colleagues in previous meetings, you know, please ask them. And I think you will find um, that I have, when the, the opportunity presents itself, I have concentrated very much on where progress is being made, where, um, uh, where the interrelationship is finding its feet, you know, using terminology like that to show that it is a process, uh, and to act in good faith. So when we have discussions around things and... You know, there are things that we both need to do, as the Chloe Smith example I gave uh, earlier. That's exactly what, uh, exactly what, what happened. So I can speak for myself, and you know, I'm content that I am very well seized of trying to make things uh, work. And um, I, you know, I, where, where ministers are fair-minded and are keen for it to be so, I'm sure we'll be getting into a better place. I hope so. Can I ask you just one specific question about your own brief in external affairs? We, we had uh, Alex Salmond giving evidence to us before and he recounted, I think it's fair to say, an elaborate tale of how he single-handedly got Anglo-Chinese relationships back on track. Um, but one of the things he said in a number of his answers was that he had no difficulty at all in having FCDO officials present at meetings and he would regularly engage with the FCDO and was very happy to have them in meetings. Um, why do you think that that's become so difficult recently? And, and why do you think when the First Minister met the President of Turkey that wasn't possible? Has there been a breakdown in those relationships as well? So again, speaking of my, my personal experience, and you'll appreciate as, as how the Government Minister was responsible for external relations, I mean, I, I'm accompanied by um, representatives of British embassies and high commissions, I, I think, to every single... Um, into ministerial meeting that I've, I've had. I'd be hard, I can't actually think if there's an example. I've got lots of examples of colleagues sitting in meetings that I've had in, in different countries uh, who, who are there and I uh, have had absolutely uh, no, uh, no difficulty than that. And in fact, more than that, so, so there, can I, ask can I, so, sorry, can I, I'm talking about myself here sure. and, and things that I was present at. Uh, I would go even further than that. I, I've met with ministerial colleagues where I facilitated the presence of the British ambassador at um, because I thought it was good that they would be able to be at that meeting. Um, so I, I think m maybe it's one of those things that um, for different reasons one wishes to concentrate on the exception rather than the, the general rule of these things. Um, uh, but if, as you say, it has been so easy for you to do that, and clearly it was for Alex Salmond, why, why has it been so difficult for Hamza Youssef? Well, I think you'll find that there have been plenty of examples of the First Minister has, has, has met with international representatives, and there has been somebody there from um, the Foreign Office. Um, but there are, sure, there are examples where, where we have the, there is no, there is no um, requirement on the Scottish Government to be accompanied to anything. There is a missive from the Foreign Office to its missions uh, about how missions and embassies are set to, uh, should approach uh, these sort of things. And in my experience, um, there is usually a very pragmatic approach to how that works, where at post, missions or embassies will take a view on, you know, cabinet secretary. I mean, I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm going to Copenhagen next week. Uh, and the embassy will be well aware of what my programme is, and a view will be taken, well, we're, we're very interested in that, but to be honest, we don't need to attend absolutely everything. And I think it's in that area where how, how does one manage things that happen in, 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 in different circumstances, you know, pat particularly where, I don't know, at, at multilateral events, um, you know, if the SCDO is, is not prepared to, to provide somebody, you know, for the entire uh, period of an event, 
um, you know, there's always going to be challenges when a lot of the, the nature of these the things, I'm just finishing yes. my point, that um, a lot of these things by their nature are sort of brushed by visits. Um, they're not these, you know, pre-organized things with a time and a place and it's exactly okay. happening there. But my experience of it in relation to me is that it has, uh, is where I'm totally relaxed about it um, and um, okay, I, sorry. the good of the FCDO was too. But I'm really keen that all colleagues are able to get an opportunity to ask some questions. So maybe just a little bit more brief and tight if the responses would be very helpful. Yep. Douglas Ross. Thank you, Chair, and good morning to our mm. panel. Uh, Mr Robertson, you've just spoken about your role with international relations, mm. uh, as you describe them, and you have travelled extensively uh, in your Cabinet position. Mm. Your Cabinet colleague, uh, Mary McAllen, said, and this is a quote from her, more often than not, world leaders are approaching the Scottish Government asking for our advice on how we have managed to lead the way. Given your role uh, you know, in charge of external relations within the Cabinet, which world leaders have approached the Scottish Government and which areas in particular are they looking for advice? Yeah. I think the area which I speak about most with whether that's heads of government or ministerial colleagues. Sorry, just for clarity, this is them coming to you. I, I know you travel extensively and, and you'll be doing a lot of that speaking in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. I presume you're going out to, to America mm -hmm. next month as well. But when is it coming the other way? As Mary McAllen said, world leaders are approaching yeah. us. Understood. So which world leaders Understood. are Understood. approaching Understood. the Scottish Government? Understood. And which areas in particular Understood. do they feel if that I, you're leading the way? If I may, may finish the, the first and, and the second question. Um, so I was about to give the, the example um, of Iceland as being a, a very good one and, and other northern European countries where there is um, a real understanding that what is happening in Scotland in relation to renewable energy um, is world leading. So there's, there's great interest um, in that and there's an attendant point with this in our northern European region which relates to hydrogen. So yes, it's about onshore wind, it's about offshore wind, about how Scotland is kind of leading the way in offshore wind. Um, and uh, but it, the point I'm trying to make is it's more than that because our colleagues, because we're all a distance from another where we can be interconnected. So working together is really important. So whether I'm talking to, and I'm giving the Icelandic example because the Icelandic Prime Minister asked me, asked me um, whether Scottish colleagues would, um, would work more with them uh, in, in this area. Uh, recently, when I met with Simon Coveney again on, on the same issue, uh, he asked for there to be a closer working relationship with the Scottish Government in relation to renewable energy in general, hydrogen specifically. I don't know if the committee is aware that um, the European Union's hydrogen backbone uh, map foresees hydrogen exports to the European <laughs> continent from Ireland being through Scotland. So whether it's interconnection from our northern European neighbours, and that might in, in the fullness of time be Iceland, be Norway, but then also Ireland as well, Having those international connections in these areas are really, really important. So to, to answer your yeah. point, Mr. Ross, yeah. specifically, that, that, that is a, mm. that's a very concrete example that comes to my mind. So you, you'd be able to share with the committee that communication where the Icelandic Prime Minister has proactively asked for this from Scotland. And then how does that get back to another Cabinet Secretary? Do you then brief the Cabinet to say, these are the world leaders that are asking us for our advice on how we lead the way? Because, you know, so how does it go from you from these uh, requests for further information to then Mary McAllen to make that bold statement yeah. in the Scottish Parliament. And, and did you endorse her making that? So on, on the specific example of how do these things work, uh, so in, 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 in formal meetings one is accompanied by a colleague that will, will take notes. Um, on, on what happened at meetings. Not everything, not, not everything is noted in meetings, right. um, but that, that meeting, as an example, was also attended by the British ambassador uh, to, to, to Iceland. Um, uh, and so that's one route by which things come back. But on this very specific uh, I uh, issue, Mr. Ross, it's something that I feel so strongly about that I've raised repeatedly in Cabinet, and I, I do in the Chamber, you've perhaps heard me talk about it, because I think it's, there's such an important opportunity for us. And working with our international colleagues is key. So it's not just in that direction, but it's also in relation to the, the FCDO. Okay. So because I, it's, so I can just finish this very briefly, Mr. It's Ross. Very, it's, very, yeah. it's very important, but it, it underscores the reason why it's important mm -hmm. to meet amongst others with the Foreign Office. The Foreign Secretary is leading negotiations with the European Union on uh, energy regulation and interconnectivity. 
So that really matters to us for all the reasons that I've just outlined. So it really the matters for the U yes, and indeed, yeah. for this is the point that I'm making. Really matters uh, for the UK government and for us that this point is is raised. And you know that is the number one thing that I raised with them. It kind of underscores why this being joined up is a good thing. So that, I mean, there's yeah. absolutely no doubt with my cabinet colleagues that I I am saying that hydrogen really matters. That in particular our northern um, neighbours are particularly interested in in all of that. So, so if we, because I think you agreed to the chair earlier that you would provide further information. If we could have a, a detailed uh, description from you of all the world leaders who approach the Scottish Government and what they ask for, useful examples you've given us here, mm. but if we could have all of that, that would be helpful. Can I ask you, how important is the census for Scotland's public services? Um, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure that that falls within the scope of intergovernmental I, relations. I Mr. Ross, on, on why please ask a question in relation to intergovernmental so, so, so relations. Yeah. How, how important is the census for Scottish public services? Well, I think the, the so to, I want I want to remain within the the yeah. uh, within so yeah, the, the chair will so stop you if, if you need indeed. Help. So I think the 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 interaction of the um, of our public authority that deals with the census and UK and other census organisations is a matter which is under constant discussion because it does matter for all governments in that intergovernmental space. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at devolution over the last 25 years and of course as the cabinet secretary in charge you took a decision to separate the scottish census from the rest of the united kingdom as a matter of fact i didn't okay so enlighten us it was my predecessor okay but you oversaw the census i did and you didn't choose to go back into the uk-wide census i didn't choose to revisit a decision by that stage we were part of a, a global pandemic mm. Um, and if, I, if anybody had raised with me the idea that it was a good idea that we send out people to doors uh, to, to speak to individuals when we were under lockdown is not something that I uh, would have uh, been supportive of. No. So why then was the return in Scotland, which was delayed from the rest of the United Kingdom, so poor in comparison? Again, so I'm, um, uh, if the chair is keen for me to remain within the intergovernmental space, I think but this there's... was a different decision that had yeah, been taken. I know you're, you will be getting there about it. Relevance well, I will, I will answer every question within the context of um, uh, intergovernmental relations on this because I think there are a lot of lessons to learn about the evolving nature of the public and its willingness uh, to deal with um, official inquiries. And as I think committee members will be aware, the census in Scotland was predominantly digital, whereas the census in the rest of the UK was not. Uh, and I think that, in part, explains a lower re initial return rate. So that is, that is issue one. I think issue two, I think there's a more general one because the rest of the world is catching up with Scotland and is moving to digital response. So I think it is one of those areas where it would be very, very good for there to be better intergovernmental relations so we can share with UK colleagues <coughs> about our learnings from this because I, I am absolutely sure that the same challenges that we face conducting a digital-led census in Scotland is one that is going to be the case in, in other parts of the world. So if the world is catching up, maybe that's another thing on your list that world leaders have been asking you about, the success of the Scottish census? I, I, I know that the matter for inter-agency uh, inter, um, uh, discussion around how does one uh, organise these things is extremely international, and that's why there was an international... Um, panel which has validated the findings of the uh, of the Scottish census and it includes officials from right around the world so I, I suppose this point about the advantages of intergovernmental relations but also our government departments working with one another about what is best practice what are the common risks what are the common challenges I mean it just underscores why it is a really good thing to work together on on one another and if 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 my if my colleague in the UK government was keen to speak to me about that I'd be delighted to meet with him or her I, I don't I, I don't think uh, there are any outstanding requests from other government ministers in the UK to meet with, with me about that. Okay. Uh, I'm told it's my final question. You have the cabinet responsibility mm. for a creative Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you have a junior minister, mm -hmm. but you are the cabinet secretary uh, responsible for that. You would have seen the uh, concerning article in the Sunday Post yesterday, expertly written, as always, by Marion Scott. What is your view on the £85,000 of National Lottery funding, but 
that was given by Creative Scotland to this project, which has been uh, rightly, uh, widely criticised. I wonder what involvement have you had since that article about the oversight of Creative Scotland? Um, so, in relation to intergovernmental relations, um, if there is any interest from other governments that want to know about arm's length funding uh, bodies, then of course I'd be happy to uh, discuss that uh, with culture. It, this uh, is quite a serious with, with issue. Culture yeah. With it's culture, also, also got not all that much well, it, to do. It, with it's got nothing to do with intergovernmental relations yeah. whatsoever. It is, um, but I'm trying to. But, yeah. but I'm trying to. I'm trying to answer the question within the context of uh, my uh, invitation to this committee. Um, I think uh, both England and Scotland <coughs> operate systems where they have independent funding bodies. Uh, that fund um, uh, applications for financial support. And if there are any lessons that need to be drawn from independent arm's length organisations, I would be happy to share that mm. uh, with colleagues from elsewhere in the UK or but anywhere any, else. Just any involvement over the weekend when you saw that? What was your immediate reaction to that? As a so an answering the question in relation to the intergovernmental space, which is the reason that I'm before this uh, committee, is I have had no uh, interest shared whatsoever by other governments in terms of how Scotland's um, creative and cultural sector is funded and is, if, they, if they wish to do so I'll be happy to do that and we shall at the leave. In, in interministerial okay. uh, group which the thank UK government has, has never mm. ever allowed to be formed. We'll leave it there. Thank you. Adam Kayser. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Angus. Nice to see you. Um, you've spoken a little bit earlier about the DRS scheme, and I mm. wanted to come back to that. So it was really interesting. There was a lot of disagreement um, over the process for seeking an Internal Market Act exclusion with both Scottish Secretary Alistair Jack and Scottish Government Minister Lorna Slater saying different things. After the announcement last year, you said that, in a quote, there is a need to look again at ensuring the Common Frameworks process, including the Internal Market Act exclusion process, operates as agreed. And what did you mean by that? And what changes or clarifications are you seeking? So, I mean, what I have said a number of times in different fora in relation to policy divergence is to draw comparison with what happened pre-Brexit, before the Common Frameworks, before the Internal Market Act, and post. And before then is a very good example of policy divergence uh, in Scotland and the rest of the UK, um, which relates to um, um, the minimum pricing of alcohol as a public health measure. And that has come about, and I don't think there is any serious um, uh, move uh, ag against that now. There was great controversy at the time, uh, but it was um, approved, and it is now part of Scotland's public health approach. Um, and I think that now, if there were to have been such a suggestion in the present time, a UK government would block that. And one would use um, the... Internal Market Act uh, to um, uh, to block that, uh, and it, it's a really good example of how the current UK government or most recent administrations of the UK government have have used this in particular policy approach uh, to to stymie uh, to stymie progress. Um, it didn't need to be this way um, if uh, there were. Uh, concerns uh, along the way as legislation was being uh, proposed, then uh, proposals for amendment could have been made, um, meetings could have been had with specific uh, suggestions. And I don't think it was about, I don't think it was about a deposit return scheme. Uh, it was a power play um, and that, that is the beginning and the end of it. And unfortunately now we don't have a deposit return scheme in Scotland and incidentally we don't have one in England. Um, uh, most of the rest of the industrialised world does. So it's really concerning what you've said there about the difference between in attitudes towards minimum unit pricing and DRS. What would you like to see moving forward? Because this isn't sustainable, surely. Well, it's not. And, I mean, just looking practically, where, where was the formal difference on the issue? It was a view in the UK government that one shouldn't uh, in, include glass in a deposit return scheme. I think I'm right in saying... I may be corrected on, but the order of this is about right. I think there are about 50, the low 50s of deposit return schemes uh, in the world. 
and 45 of those have glass. And there, it's there for a reason. Uh, it's because we're trying to take um, uh, recycling seriously um, and uh, trying to find the mechanisms uh, to do that. And unfortunately, uh, because of politicking, uh, one wasn't prepared uh, to make uh, progress on that. It wasn't always the case. I mean, the party and government actually had it in its manifesto and, uh, at a previous stage. And here's the key thing for this committee in terms of process and how pr process works. There was a green light through the common frameworks process. Um, and then the Internal Market Act, this Trojan horse uh, uh, into the workings of devolution uh, was, uh, was uh, used uh, to block the scheme. That's not about good government, it's not about good governance, and as a result, Scotland doesn't have a deposit return scheme and England doesn't. So, not good for either of us. So the Scottish Government then currently seeking an exclusion from the Internal Market Act relating to the sales of glue traps in Scotland? Well, it is, and I think my colleagues will probably have to help me about the minutiae of this. I think this is one of those areas that was to be subject to a meeting of an interministerial group. That would have been the format for such a meeting um, and answers to be held and being able to communicate the wish to do something, and, and it hasn't happened. So it's another very concrete example. I'm not sure, um, Donald Cameron, if you're in a position to... Uh, give some additional information. So make a couple of points about the specific question about um, glue traps in relation to uh, Scottish Government um, legislation. Um, so the issue of glue traps, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is not covered by a, a common framework. Um, so the process that we've used is analogous to the common frameworks process, but it isn't covered by a formal uh, common framework. And the Cabinet Secretary is correct. Um, correspondence has been um, ongoing with the, the UK UK government in relation to um, um, the need for an exclusion from the IMA um, and um, we have um, not yet secured um, a response to the question um, whether that is positive or negative um, and the, um, the latest position is that the next meeting of the EFRA IMG is the place we should expect to get the, the answer but there's been some difficulty in securing a date for that meeting to take place. When was that letter sent? Um, I don't have that detail um, just at the moment but I can let you know afterwards. Good. Thank you, that would be, that'd be really helpful. And, um, and lastly, Angus, it, moving forward, should new IGR structures have a more clearer role in the governance of the IMA, the Internal Market Act, and common frameworks processes? Um, well, yes, because I think, I mean, this goes back to um, uh, the original question from Michael about the, you know, st the, the thing about structures um, and personalities. I think, I think there is something about getting the right structures in place, because then anybody can objectively see, has one met, what was discussed, what progress was made, and if one is then able to point out time and time and time again, and not just from one devolved administration, but more than one, that this is not working, then you know there's an issue. And no doubt you will conclude that there is an issue because the facts are there for everybody to see. So I think having the structures there is a good thing. And then at least, if one is able to build on relationships where, uh, while you'll not agree on everything, um, but you know, for better public administration, it makes sense to discuss some of these things in detail, make some progress on these things, establish an iterative process and a regular, a re regular set of meetings to make sure that we have momentum behind all of this. That is the way to, to have good governance. If we were in Germany having an analogous committee inquiry about the German federal government not meeting the German lender, it would be a massive story. It would be unimaginable to have such appalling intergovernmental relations. Here, it's quite a, seen as quite a technical subject. Uh, it's one that's written about and thought about a lot by constitutional experts and academics and parliamentarians that I commend for looking at this. But the bottom line is, this is about good governance and public administration. And in this respect, in the UK, we do not have it. In other countries, it would be treated a lot more seriously. Okay. I would, and I, I, I hope that the findings of your report will be read very, very closely in Whitehall. OK, thank you. Christine Jardin. Scottish Government's 
space, that there's no willingness in the UK government to work in the common framework, they're not turning up to meetings, and that um, you describe it now as appalling in comparison to the German system. Cabinet Secretary, does the Scottish government accept no responsibility whatsoever for any difficulty in relation to the UK government? No, with none of none, none of the examples that you've uh, you've read again into the record, and they're accurate, and they, they are correct. Uh, these are statements of of fact. Um, uh, is there more that any, any fair-minded person can do? Absolutely. But I don't know how many more times I can offer to meet my opposite numbers. I don't know how many times I can say to intermediaries, please can we take a look at this and try and get some, uh, some oomph into making these uh, systems uh, work. It's not for the want of trying. It is a statement of fact that things are as they are. Um, how one changes that, I speak for myself. When I'm involved in these processes, is I do my best to encourage my colleagues uh, from the UK government um, to understand why we value this and we value a more positive um, approach and encourage people to think that it is a worthwhile uh, exercise, but it requires um, the UK government to take this seriously in a way that they haven't, and I underscore the point again, this is not a party political uh, issue given the evidence of the shared position that we have with the Welsh government. This is a devolution-related issue. Well, with respect, Cabinet Secretary, I'm, we're here to discuss the relationship between the Scottish Government and the UK Government, and I'm, I'm a bit uncomfortable at constantly quoting the Welsh Government without a Welsh representative here to do that. But if, as you say, it's entirely the fault of the UK Government, they are making incursions into areas which... Um, th they should not be, and that they are to blame for the failure of legislation. Why is it every time it goes to courts, the court rules that the UK government is in fact correct, and it's the Scottish government which is not acting within the constitutional framework? Um, well, the simple answer to that is a, it's a comparison of, of apples and, and pears in terms of uh, intergovernmental uh, relations. I mean, the point about the Welsh government is quite an important one, and if you were, could we, were could we stick, please, to the question, which is why do the courts every single time it goes to the courts? Why is it that the courts rule that the UK government is working within the UK constitutional framework, and that is? It is the Scottish Government and the legislation which it has presented, which is not. Yeah. So all of the examples that I've, I've given are not ones which are subject to, to legislation, are not well, subject, the DR... are not... The examples that I've given the committee about the workings or not workings of inter-ministerial government, about meetings not taking place or meetings being rescheduled or papers not being provided and so on and so on. Th these are not issues which one can legislate for nor mm -hmm. can one take them to court. So that's the, the why I'm making the point about comparing apples and pears. In terms, in terms of the day and daily interaction between the Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish government and the UK government, in the areas that I've described, these are specifically not areas uh, which one can raise in, in, in a court of law. It is about best practice. And does that best practice work or does it not work? About specific um, issues of specific court challenges, all of that is in the public realm. None of that is specifically relevant to the evidence that I've been given giving today about the workings of the structures of intergovernmental uh, relations. They're not, they're not subject to courts. They are subject to goodwill, and unfortunately, there hasn't been very much of that. Would, would you not concede that if it ends up in court, regardless of the issue, whether it is an apple, a pear, or an orange, if it ends up in court, it is because the relationship between the two governments has been unable to resolve it. And when it is resolved in court, it, is, it has been consistently the view of the courts that the UK government is acting within the constitutional framework and on specifically on you mentioned the DRS scheme and you blamed the UK government for that and described it as a power play is it not in fact the case that it wasn't solely the view of the UK government that the scheme could not work properly it was the view of a great number of major uh, companies manufacturers glass manufacturers glass distributors whiskey companies, beer companies, that the scheme was unworkable. And it wasn't an objection to glass. It was an objection to the fact that the scheme wouldn't work. And to suggest that that's um, 
because devolution isn't working is to overlook the fact that it might just have been bad legislation. Well, um, firstly, it's the Scottish Parliament's responsibility to, to legislate in, in devolved areas, not any other parliament. That wasn't my and question. So my question I, was, was it not simply that you're blaming the relationship for the fact that it was bad legislation? No, the legislation was passed, and if anybody... That doesn't to, make it good. If, if, that just makes it passed. It so, doesn't make it good. Well, when we are talking about when we're talking about devolution, we are talking about where decisions should be made, whether one agrees with them or not. And I'm I'm, I'm perfectly willing to accede that that Christine Jordan mm -hmm. have a, and I have a different view on whether something was uh, worthwhile uh, proceeding with in relation to intergovernmental relations. And this point, if there were, and this and this goes back to the the point that I made right at the start. I'd far rather be talking not about dispute resolution, but dispute avoidance. Mm -hmm. And it is the case that there are a great many things which one just doesn't hear about, and they don't become matters of great import, um, because one has been able to deal with them on that official-to-official -official level, or where one has these structures of being able to get together. And that is my preferred route with dealing mm -hmm. with all of these things. If there had been goodwill about being able to deliver such a scheme, then one would have been able to see that far earlier in the process from the UK government, which, which one did not. And, and the end of, of uh, the, the, uh, the lesson, as I've already mentioned now a couple of times, is neither Scotland nor the rest of the United Kingdom has a t deposit return scheme. So that's a great shame. If one had wished to make things workable or better um, or deliverable, then one would have done a lot more about it. One didn't do that. Sorry, to be clear, the UK government did not do that. Can I just, on that point, um, the secretary, the cabinet secretary assumed he knew my view on the DRS scheme. Can I say he's incorrect about my view on the I'm, DRS scheme? I'm happy to be corrected. Um, and could I just, um, one final point about that is that, do you think that the people of Scotland are happy with the fact that they constantly see conflict between the two governments, which ends up in court. And do you think that perhaps, rather than constantly making what the UK government would see as incursions into areas that are not in the devolution settlement, mm. such as external affairs, that perhaps it might be better to take a more um, conciliatory approach and try and avoid these court cases so and that this cannot entirely be one-sided. As Mr Shank said, respect yeah. goes two ways, yeah. so does discussion. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure one wouldn't, wouldn't want to miss the point that this isn't just a concern for the Scottish Government, that the concerns I have outlined and are one can evidence because of the record, that what, which Mark Drakeford has said and other colleagues in the Welsh Government, the critique that I have been making is shared by the Scottish and Welsh Government. So no doubt many people in both Scotland and Wales are dismayed. Uh, about the state of intergovernmental relations, but any fair-minded person with a fair-minded uh, grip of the reality, the reality of what is causing the problem, will conclude that unfortunately okay. it is the UK government. All right, we're, going, we're going to have to move on, sorry, we've not got much time left. David Jukit. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary and your colleagues for coming along today. Um, Continuing from Christine Jardin's question there, obviously a lot of that was about the deposit return scheme, but whether it was the deposit return scheme being brought in a year earlier than the rest of the UK, or the UK was proposing, or the Gender Recognition Bill, or HPMAs being more stringent than what the UK government was proposing, um, how much of that was, quite frankly, just not, not delivering something for the for the good intentions behind it, that no doubt was, there was, but how much of that was made difficult for the sake of making it difficult, knowing that the UK government were going to be put in a position of being against it, and then essentially picking a fight? Well, if one wants to pick the, the Gender Recognition um, Act as, as an issue, I think the committee is aware that this is a piece of legislation that was passed with cross-party support in the Scottish Parliament, including members of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party that, that voted for it, and there was a majority ac across the, the Parliament. I think the motivation of, of everybody, including Conservative colleagues that voted for it, was to try and get the best legislation that we, can, that we could, looking at the fact that other countries had done so, uh, and wanting to make sure that we were able to do so here as well. And um, this goes back to my 
uh, this goes back to my uh, observation previously about what happened with uh, minimum unit pricing on, on alcohol, where there, in that case there were objections from industry as well, but one still proceeded with the legislation because it was the right thing to do. Of course, legislation will always bring controversy, and some people will agree with it and some people will not. But to me, there's a more profound point here. It's not actually the merits of the issue at hand. Mm. It's about governance and good governance and how that works. And in, in, in a devolution context, these are areas that have been devolved where there is, of course, uh, there are areas where one could and should be working with colleagues in uh, other governments in the UK around alignment, about managing divergence, because there will be divergence as the very nature of devolution, that we should be using the structures in place to try and make this possible. And these are all examples that are being given where that has not happened. And it is not for the want of colleagues in the Scottish uh, Government uh, to try and seek that. Unfortunately, it has been by the politicization of these very particular uh, issues uh, to stymie them, where in previous examples, and the minimum unit pricing example is the best one, is that notwithstanding the fact that there were industry concerns around that, uh, because the view was that it, this was an area in public health that was devolved, the Scottish Government could get on with it. That's exactly what happened, and the European courts did not gainsay that. But given the... the uh uh, possibly unintended consequences of this legislation being passed. And again, not judging on the, on the validity or the good intentions behind these, uh, the, uh, the issues discussed, given the fact that the Gender Recognition Reform Bill was, was, uh, was the one and only ever time that Section 35 have been, has been invoked because of the impact it would have on UK-wide uh, uh, legislation, namely the UK Equalities Act. Was there no one in the Scottish Government actually knew that that was going to be the case, that it could be an issue? Was there no engagement? In fact, I know, for, I know there was engagement with the UK Government in which warning was provided that that could be the case or would be the case. So why power through with that? So I think, I think um, at the heart of that was throughout the longest time of the, the, the proceeding of that, that legislation, there had been no indication uh, that that sanction, that blocking mechanism, was one that was being considered. It was very, very much at the end of the process that that was the case. And this goes to the nub of the, the point that I've been trying to make a number of times, which is if we have structures in place where one can regularly meet, regularly discuss what one is, is doing, yes, the things that, that are on the agenda, mm. but those things that might come under uh, any other business at the end of a meeting where a government minister could say, listen, it's brought to me my attention that there may be an issue with this and we'd like to work with you about how we can resolve a situation like that. If these institutions were up and running and running properly, if there was a wish to have proper bilateral relation relationship between uh, cabinet secretaries or between junior ministers, that is exactly the way that one should deal with this, not with taking out a constitutional hammer to, uh, to hit a nut uh, which has become politicised and it is for a political reason that has been done, in my view, not um, from an issue of good or bad legislation, um, but it is because it has well, been, think, become think... politicised. But, I mean, sticking, sticking to the nub yeah. and where we can... I mean, I want to move on to other questions, but I'll, I'll, take, I'll take your point of view on that. But I think mm -hmm. there are those who would... Uh, suggest that uh, the, the issue itself was pushed more rapidly than it needed to be for political reasons as well. But I'll leave it at that. I think the, I think the Secretary of State for Scotland has argued as well in, in the evidence of this committee uh, to that effect. But last thing I wanted to ask on the Gender Recognition Reform Bill uh, process was there has been, there is an inter intergovernmental dispute resolution mechanism. Mm. So why was that not used? and uh, rather the introduction of a judicial review was uh, chosen instead. Yeah, so I think there's a timing issue around that, and this is my point about when the power was invoked, but I'll defer to Donald Cameron on the, the, the specifics of that. I think it was a timing issue, Mr Duguid. So, so I think the, the issue, um, uh, Mr Duguid, is that um, I don't think there was sufficient awareness um, that the, of the UK government's um, intention to... Um, um, to, to block the legislation or to intervene in the way that it did, I think, and uh, I would have to, to check the 
specific at this point is that the, um, the, the real concern that was being expressed by the UK government was um, expressed very late in the day and perhaps as late as the, um, the, the morning or the day before the stage three um, debate in the Scottish Parliament and that there had not been um, you know, prior notification of the level of concern and in fact um, in relation to the point about whether anybody in the, um, you know, the Scottish Government were aware of the potential impacts, you know, if there had been ongoing discussion about the potential use of a sex... Sorry, sorry to interrupt, order. but that was despite the hundreds of amendments to the legislation as it was passing? So the, the specific was? intention um, to intervene in the way that um, subsequently happened was not um, something that... So, um, so again, I mean, my understanding of the Section 35 process is a process that's always gone through in every piece of legislation, but this was the first time that the decision was made to not offer or to not uh, allow royal, uh, royal assent. Um, but it's a process that goes through at the end of that process. So, so, yeah. so, so, I'll, so anyway, I, th I think I want to move on from that because I, I know time's limited and I want to just ask, go back to something the Cabinet Secretary was saying earlier about hydrogen. Um, hmm. Now, we, we received, the committee received uh, evidence from uh, the then Cabinet Secretary for Energy and Net Zero, Michael Matheson, and I've, I've got to be honest, this was the first I heard that there was this, these discussions going on with... Uh, uh, the federal government of Germany, among others, mm. in, in coming up with a, an agreement that Scotland, essentially, to simplify, Scotland would produce loads of hydrogen and Germany, among others, in Northern Europe uh, would be customers for that hydrogen. Um, like I said, that was the first I'd heard of it. I did some digging within the energy industry around Scotland uh, and I, was, I became aware that various engagements had been made with them. Um, uh, and some companies had been commissioned by the Scottish Government to, to look into the feasibility, etc. Uh, and as I said, already there had been meetings taking place with the Federal Government of Germany. My question is, what discussions, what meetings have been had with UK Government Ministers mm -hmm. on that? Yeah. Bear, be a very, bear, bearing in mind the, the, the reserved nature of international trade, energy policy, cross-border transmission okay. of energy. Order. I'll, I'll have to be a very brief response because I'm really keen to make yeah. sure Sally Ann Hart gets Well, that's my last question. I think, I think if I could get a I'll briefly. do it briefly because I'm just repeating yeah. the example that I gave before. So I spoke with James Cleverly, the, the UK Foreign Secretary, in his office about this, that very point, And I look forward to speaking with his successor about it again. But was that in advance or after the discussions with the German federal government? I, ca I can't remember the exact uh, dates. But Could just you, as a correction, I mean, the Scottish... I, I'm, really, so, sorry, right, order. Okay. I'm really keen to move on, so maybe you could write to... Of the course, committee. happy, happy to you. Happy to sorry. Sorry. on that. Sally Ann Hart. Thank you, Chair, and good morning to our panel. So some areas of inter intergovernmental activity, such as the Green Free Ports, Fiscal mm. Framework, which we've mentioned, negotiations, and city-region deals have been regarded as successful... Um, so my question is, um, what made these successful compared with other areas of intergovernmental working? Was it the funding from the UK government? Was it a working together approach, putting politics and egos aside for a common goal? Was that what made it successful? I think it's, I think it's simpler than that. Um, it might indeed be funding from the Scottish government as well as funding yes. from, from the UK government, might it not as well. Um, I think it's where there's an alignment of interest. I think where it's very, very obvious from the off that there are particular policy suggestions where firstly, you know, the devolution unit, Michael Gove or the Scotland office says, ah, this is actually insignificant area devolved. So it's really, really important for the UK government to work with the Scottish government. And from our side, the analogous pro process <clears throat> where issues are brought up, there's a recognition that this, par this is partially reserved and partially devolved. This goes back to Mr. Dugard's point, where I'm, you know, this issue that's so close to my heart is partly devolved and is partly reserved. And we are going to have to get both of these things working right with goodwill to deliver on them, and I'm absolutely seized of that. But the nub of the answer to your question is, I think, in these particular examples, which I acknowledge as being good examples, and we should strive to do that with absolutely everything, is where there's an alignment of interest and agreement. I think where there is a difference, and that at the heart of it is what devolution is about, is about being able to do things in one's own way, and that is as true for the Scottish Government as it is for the UK Government in relation to England, is that we have to be able to have that grown-up approach of how do we manage difference, divergence, different priorities, and be able to do that in the best possible way. But the short so, answer to the question is there is a shared interest. It's, it's building up trust mm -hmm. between the two governments that clearly needs to be... Mm -hmm. um, done better. So just are there additional, 
picking up on the back of that, are there additional policy areas um, where you are optimistic that the governments could work together? I mean, policy areas which might build unity between well, Scotland and the rest of the UK, setting aside, let's just set mm -hmm. aside the SNP's independence agenda, set aside anger over Brexit, it's done, and set aside politics. Could both governments prioritise common goals, for example, on NHS reform or economic growth or something like that? So I'll speak to the area that is in within yeah. my, where, where I have, have a direct interest uh, in and intergovernmental uh, relations is this point that I began to address in relation to Mr. Duguid's, um, uh, Mr. Duguid's question. In Scotland, we are blessed to have won twice on the natural resource lottery uh, with hydrocarbons in the 60s and 70s and now in terms of, of renewables at scale. Uh, what is clear... Um, in speaking with other Northern European nations where we all tend to be windy and, wind, 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 windy and wet countries is that we're going to be in a very strong position to be uh, not, not windy countries um, uh, where we are, as a, for the record I was looking at Wendy Chamberlain there at that, at that point, insider Scottish Affairs Committee joke um, uh, looking at uh, our other shared interests of our Northern European neighbours who have a real interest in being able to help provide the resources that the European continent requires. We will be net energy exporters. Mm -hmm. We have been net energy exporters of hydrogen, hydrocarbons. We will be net um, uh, electricity exporters and we'll most probably be uh, hydrogen exporters as well. And being able to do that right now when the biggest economy in, in Europe, Germany, is interested in importing it from wherever it can is a really, really good area where we can work together. So whether that's in the bilateral conversations that I had with James Cleverly, where it's in the conversations I had at the Koenigswinter um, uh, meeting, where again I asked this question in the company of a whole series of people from the, from the UK Parliament as well, we are working very hard to, um, uh, to, to work with the UK government to help on that regulatory point and on the interconnectivity point because surely it is a matter above and beyond party interests or different constitutional preference that just as people um, made really significant decisions as hydrocarbons were discovered um, in, in this part of Europe. We look at our, our neighbours in, in Norway and see what they were able to do uh, in a way that the UK didn't um, with, with oil and gas uh, in Scotland. We cannot repeat these same mistakes with renewable electricity uh, and with hydrogen. So I'm really keen to grab that and with both hands and that's why I'm so keen to... Have you energy report from the Scottish Affairs Select Committee? It's brilliant. You ought to have a look at it. I, well, thank and you very we much. really focused on green hydrogen because we went to Germany. It was absolutely fantastic. And actually the UK government has looked at that and have made some real positive impact with the um, contracts for differences. So I think that, that you know, we can work together. So the, the, the deliverable, so the, the deliverable that really matters for our continental European colleagues is interconnectivity, which doesn't exist, which might exist and should exist, but should be in everybody's interest to try and secure. Um, there is not a currently functioning hydrogen market yet. We know it's coming. It's coming. We know the Germans require it. I think the academic um, uh, assessment is that Northern Europe can provide 10% of continental Europe's uh, hydrogen demand. That's significant given that Robert Habeck is travelling to Namibia and Mozambique and all kinds of uh, countries in the Gulf to try and secure hydrogen. Well, why do we not make it easier for friends in continental Europe to be able to import from Northern Europe? Scotland is in a fantastic geostrategic position close to Ireland, which will export to the continent through Scotland, looking at northern neighbours from Greenland to Iceland to Faroes, across to Norway and Denmark. All of us have an interest in being interconnected connected with the European continent. Okay. So anything that can be done on regulation and interconnectivity is key to that. Those are reserved and that's where we require the UK government to act and I really hope okay. they will. Right. Uh, I'm afraid that's our time up. I mean, of course, everybody should be reading Scottish Affairs Committee reports. <laughs> here, um, Cabinet here, Secretary, here. thank you ever so much for your evidence this morning. I think there's a few things that you said you'd get back in touch with yeah, this committee. Yeah. If you could no please do that and, and as I know you'll do it in a timely way. But for your contribution and your time this morning, Thank you ever so much from all the committee. Order, order.